right, folks, we're, we're about uh, 30 seconds from being live. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Booth Western Art Museum. I'm Seth Hopkins, the Executive Director. Thank you for uh, coming to Art for Lunch or tuning into Art for Lunch today. We're a very special program, so I'm not going to take up too much time, but I do want to mention our big event for 2023 coming up, and that's our annual gala, February 17th and 18th. And we have a lot of special things going on that weekend. We'll be honoring two artists this year, John and Terry Kelly Moyers from California. We also will have an uh, appearance by Teddy Roosevelt will be here with us uh, in the person of the, uh, the best Teddy Roosevelt reenactor in the world. And there's a bunch of them, actually, so it's not like he's the only one. And he's really good. I've seen him before. Also, the musical duo Rob and Trey, who are the uh, musicians on the Cowboy CD, Rhythm and Rhymes, that we uh, just released uh, earlier last year. And... Um, they will be doing a special performance at the Boots and Saddles event, which is on Friday night of that weekend. So please get your tickets now. They are going quickly. Um, we'll have about 60 pieces of art that will be for sale, and we'll be putting those up online next week so that you can see what we're going to have uh, available to purchase. Um, big thanks to those who have already signed up, uh, who bought tickets or signed up to be point riders, and also... Uh, Big shout out to our chairs, Ray and Palma Rhodes, who are chairing Boots and Saddles this year, and uh, Doug and Susie Haugen, who are here with us, that are our chairs for our gala event. Thank you, thank you. Um, our next Art for Lunch will be on February 1st, and we will have the artist Phil Epp here. Phil is uh, a member of the Cowboy Artists of America, and one of the most contemporary style artists in that group. And the Booth Museum recently acquired a uh, major painting of his at the Cowboy Artist Show and Exhibition, and we'll be uh, doing a little unveiling of it that day. So please join us for that. So as we turn to a new year and we think about renewal, I think this is a wonderful time to be bringing this exhibition to the Booth Museum. And it is a first time really experience for us to do something that really is uh, a community service as much as it is a wonderful art exhibition, which it truly is. Um, those of you who know me, know me that know everything reminds me of a song. Um, and actually this reminds me of two songs. Amid all this negative news that we have out there today, I think it's gonna be a wonderful opportunity today to meet some uh, incredible people who are doing good in the world and who are achieving great things. That's the people who run the Love Lady Center in Birmingham, where up to 400 women are there at any given time, uh, seeking remedies to their hurdles and their challenges in life. The people who work with them, the staff and the board and so on, and then the wonderful artists who have documented their graduation uh, from that experience and are showing us the hope that is in those people. So one of the songs is called The Change. It's recorded by Garth Brooks. It's written by a friend of ours, Tony Arata, who, by coincidence, uh, will be here doing a songwriter showcase in March with our Writers Guild. But the song kind of goes, uh, one hand reaches out to help just one, while thousands more go wanting. And I'm paraphrasing here. And they say, you know, what good is that, to help just one? It's like whispering a prayer into the fury of the storm or trying to put out the fire with the moisture from a kiss. And the chorus goes something like, I do this not to change the world, but to let the world know it will not change me. And another song that it reminds me of is by Tennille Towns, who's a Canadian songwriter. And she did a song called Somebody's Daughter. And it talks about a lady on the side of the road with a sign 
asking for money or food. And she says, what happened? Did she just get left behind or did she get forgotten? She's somebody's daughter. She's somebody's sister. She's somebody's mother. She's somebody's wife. What happened? And it challenges us to think about those things and to dedicate ourselves to doing what we can to help, perhaps. So that's the theme of this exhibition. And we're going to hear from some of the people who helped bring it to us today. And tomorrow night, we'll have the official opening ceremony for the exhibition. So we invite you all to come back for that. We also will be doing a resource fair where we have community entities that are involved in helping in these types of situations. So if you know somebody who needs help or know a family that's facing issues related to this, please encourage them to come tomorrow night and to take advantage of that opportunity. Portraits of Hope, Inspirational Stories from the Love Lady Center is a project that was the idea of Beverly McNeil, an art gallery owner in Birmingham, Alabama, during the height of the pandemic. She was looking for ways to assist the Love Lady Center with fundraising, but more importantly, to give a voice to the many success stories that have come from the center, which is a faith-based, life-changing facility where women come to live for nine months to a year, easier to either to finish out a prison term or they are self-admitted seeking help with addiction, addiction or recovery. So the folks we will hear from today um, are our guest speakers, John McNeil, the chairman and chief operating officer of the Love Lady Center. He will share the story of Brenda Love Lady Spawn and how the center came into being. Beverly Blount McNeil is the gallery owner and the owner of Portraits, Inc., which is a business that matches well-respected portrait artists with potential clients. And she will discuss her idea and the work involved in publishing the Portraits of Hope book, which I hope you'll take the opportunity to check out. The uh, cover is shown on the screen, and that's available in the store for $45, with all the proceeds going to the center. We'll then hear from portrait artist Carol Baxter Kirby from Atlanta, Georgia, and she will share her involvement with this project from an artist standpoint. And she's known for her commitment to the highest artistic standards and a love for people that has led to hundreds of commissions on display across the country. And finally, we'll hear from Amanda Clarity, who is a graduate and a success story from the Love Lady Center, and will share her personal story of addiction and the message that there is hope out there. So. With that introduction, please welcome John to begin the program. Well, let me begin by first, uh, Seth. I want to give uh, my heartfelt thanks to not only you, but your amazing team here at the booth. Uh, working with this, with the organization here at the booth to bring this exhibit here has been just kind of one of the great joys that Beverly and I have had. Uh, the conversation, I think Lisa and I were speaking about that earlier, the conversation for this started a year ago, uh, back in January of last year, about the possibility of coming, and ever since then, working with them, and then as we've had meetings over the time and coming here, we've been fortunate enough to meet some of the amazing people in this area that are kind of in this recovery venue. So Seth, thank you to you and your team, and then to the wonderful people. I know Barbara's in the room with us, I believe today and, and maybe several others that are that are working in this you know kind of same area to try to help people that are dealing either either with prison reentry or addiction recovery and uh, and so the, the love lady center was actually the, the genesis of the kind of the porches of hope project and what goes on at the love lady center so I'll back up a little minute and kind of give you shortly why am I standing up here at the podium to talk about it uh, well the big reason is about 10 years ago uh, God decided to yanked me out of my comfortable existence after I had retired from a, a career in real estate development uh, and we did resort and residential development. Uh, spent the last 15 years in Destin, Florida because, you know, somebody had to do it. Um, and, uh, and, and then, you know, coming back to Birmingham, it was just a situation of, of circles touching circles and I got introduced to the center because it actually came into being. The, the center was not founded until 2004 in Birmingham. So it came into being when I was in the Destin area. So when I returned to Birmingham, I knew little or nothing about the Love Lady Center. But it was circles touching circles and then God opening doors that allowed me to step in there 
and get involved from the operational side of this amazing ministry. Uh, <clears throat> so quickly, as Seth said, I'm going to tell you how the Love Lady Center came into being and a little bit about what we do today. So you can kind of see now, Brenda has written a book about this, and so I'm going to give you just a little brief first part of that book. But if you get an opportunity, you can go on, you know, go on Amazon, that sort of place, and, and get this book. You ought to read it. It's a lot of fun. The book has been picked up by a Hollywood production firm. Uh, and actually, Faster Horses Pictures is, is the production company, and one of the primary partners there is the, uh, is the lady who just did Redeeming Love and several other, you know, uh, pictures, Father Stu, and the director is the one that did Father Stu. Um, and so that's, they're turning it into a major, major motion picture. Viola Davis wants to play the part of the primary character, Shay, who was the first woman that came to Brenda's home when she started the ministry. So hopefully it's going to be a, a Hollywood movie here at some particular point in time. But Brent, Brenda's, as she said, her background was she, you know, she grew up in a wonderful home, but she said, you know, my daddy was a journeyman plumber. We actually lived in a manufactured home. And she said, so for most of my life, I wanted things. You know, I wanted nice things. Um, and she said that uh, even though she knew God, you know, kind of had a calling on her life at an early age, she chose to, as she said, go a different path. Uh, and she was. She was very successful. She ran a bunch of tax offices in Birmingham. She did a, had a mortgage company. She was doing you know, quite well. Uh, but then, as she said, circumstances that God directed, I kind of ran afoul with uh, not particularly myself, but my organization with the IRS. And she ended up basically kind of doing this plea bargain deal with the IRS to keep from literally going to jail herself. And she said she, as she was going through that process, she was actually praying and said, you know, God, if, if you keep me out of jail, uh, I, will, I will, you know, reach out to the women that I was about to become one of them. And so she started going into the work release center in Birmingham, and she saw the revolving, the problem of the revolving door with the prison system. They would come, they'd be so excited about being released, and then within a matter of sometimes weeks, days, oftentimes months, she would see, see those same women back, you know, back in the system again. So she went to DOC in Montgomery and said, <coughs> don't you have some way to help these ladies when they leave prison? And they said, well, we have halfway, halfway houses around the state that they can go to. And so her answer was, well, they don't need a halfway house. They need a whole way house. And that's when she convinced the Department of Corrections to let some of the prisoners come to her home in Birmingham. Uh, the interesting thing about that is the Department of Corrections has had a lot of people who had approached them about trying to help however they could. And they kind of called them do-gooders, for lack of a better word. And they generally lasted for just a brief period of time, and then the work became much more difficult and more than they really had bargained for, and they would just give up. And so they thought they would go ahead and put this thing to rest. And I remember I said Brenda had been going into the work release center. The prisoners she was meeting with were the best behaved, the ones who actually could go out, work during the day, and come back into the work release center. The first seven prisoners they sent to her home, every one of them came with their prison jacket. And every, the front of every one of those prison jackets was stamped, cannot rehabilitate. The prison system had given up on these women. Shea Curry Bell, whose portrait you'll see downstairs, was the first one that stepped off that van when it pulled up into her yard. Brenda looks out her window and sees this woman, prison bulked up, head shaved, everything she owns in a little brown paper bag, step off that van. And the first thought that came into her mind was, oh my God, somebody's going to die. And she was thinking about herself. Uh, uh, and so the, but the long story short is all of that again was kind of God's plan and purpose for this because it was in Shay who had been abused, terribly abused by the system. She was physically and sexually abused as a very young girl. She was passed around to family members and she ended up as a prostitute on the streets of Mobile at 12 years old. And so she had been in and out of prison. Uh, you know, her, the, the pimps got her hooked on drugs and, you know, it's just inevitable that that's where she was going to end up. And it was... And it was, it was coming from, and she was back in Tutwiler for the third time, this time for killing a guy. And when you find out what he was doing to her, you understand why she did what she did. Um, but it, so that's who stepped, stepped off with, with that history in, you know, in her mind. So she had absolutely, she absolutely believed that there was nobody anywhere on this planet that cared about her. If there was anything that they wanted to do with her, it was what they could get from her. Brenda, of course, had no idea what this a, a life like this was about she and she had never experienced anything at that you know obviously at that kind of level and it was in the two of them learning to trust each other and to teach each other 
um, as uh, Shay said, as more women started coming to the program, she would all often warn Brenda that said, listen, every time you talk to one of these ladies for the first time, you let, need to let me be there because you're just not street smart and they're going to fool you every time. And so she was always the first one to kind of step in there and, and you know, call a, a spade a spade. So very quickly, the, the, she started with those first seven. Within six months, she had 40 women in her home. She had literally moved out of her master bedroom, put bunk beds in, into the bedroom, and, and, and literally had women living all over the house and, and was making great progress. I mean, it was really going well. Judges were hearing about it. The prison system was thrilled with what she was doing. And the newspaper came out to write a feel-good story about what she was doing, and they did. And it was a big one in the Sunday newspaper. But then when that newspaper hit all the houses in the surrounding neighborhood, because her, the way her home is situated, she has, she has acreage around her home. So you can't see her home. You can see her driveway, but you can't see her home from the rest of the streets and everything. And so, you know, the first reaction was, wow, that's where my lawn chair went. Uh, but, you know, in all, in all fairness, clearly it wasn't, it, this was a neighborhood. So it wasn't zoned for you know, bringing prisoners, you know, and that sort of stuff. So they got pretty much up in arms. And uh, so long story short, God, <coughs> she knew she had to move, and God ended up directing her to an old hospital building in the East Lake area of Birmingham. And the story of how she was able to acquire that building is another miracle. But so moved into that building, and then very quickly the program just began to e explode in the number of women coming and seeking help. Uh, and as Seth mentioned, we uh, it, it is a... So what, if somebody said, well, what does a Love Lady Center do? We are a faith-based, long-term prison reentry and drug rehabilitation program. The women live with us. As if, if you do the program as fast as it can be done, it takes nine months. Most of them live with, with us a year, a little bit longer. And, um, and so at our core, as I've said, we are a faith-based program. Our, our belief is that it's a, yes, there are tendencies and there are you know, things you want to give them but there's still the issue of the heart. And if a woman is gonna do one of two things, forgive herself for making really bad choices that had her ending up where she was, or forgiving someone else in the situation like Shay, the only way that can be done is in understanding you know, who God says you are and why we are supposed to love and forgive like we do. Uh, and so that's the, the core piece of our program. But then we add everything we can to it. The women come to us, still with some of their prison sentence left or now probably most of our women come court ordered from the different courts around tennessee some in georgia and some i'm mean, around alabama some in tennessee and some in georgia and some in mississippi that have learned of our program and will send the women there as opposed to sending them to prison or jail uh, they go through five phases of the program they have to earn 36 class credits they have to have a minimum of a dozen 12 counseling sessions um, they have to do job readiness work while they're there and they work most of the time at a job, well, all of them work is while they're in the program in the center itself, whether it's in housekeeping, at our thrift store, in the kitchen, in the kid zone. We are one of the largest, possibly the largest, it's you know, hard to tell, program of its type in the country that allows, you know, that has that many women, but also allows the children to be there with their mother. Now, it is not, we do not um, recommend that if a child has a safe environment or a good family situation to stay in for the child to come there. But in many cases, based on what got them there, the entire rest of their family is in addiction or there is no family, and so there's no safe place for the child. So the reason we have those children there is we realize the mother, if she's concerned about the child, cannot focus on her own recovery. And so uh, I don't want to, I, I could go, sad part is Beverly said, I see you're standing up over there, which means you need to quit talking. Uh, so just to tell you very quickly, as he said, we have over four, we, are, we stay full. 420 women and about 60 children that are with us all the time. And since it opened in 2004, there's been over 12,000 women that have come through the, you know, through the program. Uh, and so it's just, it's an amazing place where amazing things happen, but I think I'm supposed to quit talking. So if you want to catch up with me later with other questions about the center, I'd be glad, be glad to do that. And now I'm going to tell you what, what Beverly's part and everything is, because when you get involved in something like this, your family gets brought in there with, <laughs> with, with you. And so, uh, so I'm going to bring my wife up here and let her talk about Fortress of Hope. Well, as you can tell, he's got a lot of passion, and sometimes I have to keep a hook because he'll talk for hours, and I knew y'all, we've got other people to hear from. So as he got involved, our entire family got involved and just fell in love with the program and what it was doing, and 
specifically the women that we met in, in the, um, at the Love Lady Center. And I started doing a community Bible study, and I would have just the women from the Love Lady come to our church and got to know them really, really well. And um, Amanda, who you're going to hear from, um, I've known five or six years now, and it's just amazing to see what's happened in their lives. So I was very excited, and I wanted, and I had a, a portrait company called Portraits, Inc., and I knew that the artists are so generous and so wonderful that they'd probably be willing to paint some of the subjects. But I couldn't figure out how it would maybe help the center or make money, or I, I just wasn't real sure. And then right about COVID, it came to me. I said, if the artists will agree to do a book, we publish the book, and then we'll take it around to different exhibits. And I mean, it sounded really easy at the time. It, there was a lot of pieces to it. Um, since then, I've sold the company, Portrait Sync, to B.B. Bernard and Jennifer Gray, who are here, and they are doing a fantastic job, and they let me keep a little office, and they listen to a few of my ideas sometimes. So that part's really fun, and I'm doing Portraits of Hope full-time, which has just been a real blessing. The artists just overwhelmingly were excited about it, and we have got these artists are so well respected across the country and some in the world and they took time and it was during COVID. So half were done in person, half were done, uh, the portraits were started with either Facebook, I mean uh, FaceTime where I'd have a photographer and I'd be, you know, translating what the artist wanted. And they have each donated these portraits which will eventually will hang at the Love Lady Center as a wall of hope for the women. Meantime, we're trying to go out and get the word out, and to be able to come to the booth is just huge, and it's going to open so many doors um, to other places, too, because every time we go, somebody um, just says, you know, the hope that it gave them, or just, it, it's just a powerful exhibit. I hope you'll get a chance to go down and see it and come back. So then we selected the girls, and then it was a real matching game to figure out which artists would work best with which of the ladies and so that worked out and then you know each time I, I thought well I'll just it would be like you know three weeks to get the artist what they needed and then they'd have to paint it it's just the whole thing's been a process but it has been so exciting to be a, a part of and any books sold and any donations to Portraits of Hope go for helping the women after they graduate because what we've learned, uh, well, of course, they knew this at the center, but um, many of them don't have driver's license. They have back electrical bills, so they can't move back into an apartment. They just, there's so many barriers that keep them um, from being as successful as they're ready to be. So that's what we do. We grant um, scholarships to help pay. We don't do any restoration, is that the right? Restitution fees, because that's, they need to pay those back, but um, we do help them with back fines and help them get their driver's license and um, just barriers like that. And we've been paying for them to go to school to get a degree so they can get better jobs. And so that's what buying the book helps and any donations. But um, again, to be able to be at the booth and to get to see them hanging in such a professional spot is just amazing. We've been taking them around to different places and. We just recently, and every time something amazing happens at each place, but we were doing a little one night thing in Linville, North Carolina in a lodge, and we were hanging them up, and this lady walked in while we were hanging, and she looks around, she said, tell me about this. So we started telling her what, what we were doing, and she went, well, I'm a reporter for the Washington Post. I'm going to write a story. Well, it turns out her brother had a major, major heart failure the next like two days later and she had to take care of him so it didn't happen for six months where she called me and about November I think and she went I the article's written it's getting ready to come out I need to verify a couple of facts we did that and then the next thing we sold books in over 18 different states from the online article because you could just punch and buy it and then it came out and I, I got uh, emails from different people that I know in different cities because the uh, the um, columnist was syndicated, which was really, really exciting. So we are just thrilled to be here, and thank you so much for coming. And the I'm going to bring Carol Baxter Kirby, who is just one of the finest people I know and a wonderful artist, and she has just been a great friend 
and I've known her now 20 something years. So. Thank you, Beverly. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be with you today and to uh, share a little bit about Portraits of Hope from an artist's perspective. And um, I have been painting portraits professionally since 1990, and um, it has just been a joy and a journey. And as an artist, uh, portrait artist, we think, well, the most important thing is to get a likeness. Everybody wants to know, can you get a likeness? Will it look like the person you're painting? But a portrait is so much more than a likeness. A portrait is really a story about someone. And as an artist, technical skill matters, but also how we view people, how we can read people and portray a glimpse into their life is a huge task and, um, and something that I've always enjoyed the challenge of. And one of the things I wanted to share with you is about how we see ourselves and how others see us and how that fits into a portrait. Uh, when I paint a child's portrait, they're just the easiest. They do not have any identity issues. They have not, they don't tell you what they've accomplished, who, you know, who they belong to, where they're going in life. They are just enjoying the pleasure of being. And uh, they're just so easy. And I love it. But when I paint adults, and I love painting adults, but there are identity issues that come into place and how they view themselves and then how we are trying to portray them. I found out early on, even a young teenage girl who does not have one ounce of fat on her body will say, don't paint this flap under my arm. I'm like, there is none. But, you know, they're just so self-conscious about everything. And... Uh, what the, and I was working with a young lady uh, a couple of weeks ago, and she said, oh, don't photograph me from this side. That's my bad side. And I mean, we, we do sometimes have a good and a bad side, but, um, but it really matters how we view ourselves. And in this exhibition, Portraits of Hope, one of the beautiful things is, and it's the truth for all of us, is what makes us of value and what makes our worth is not what we've done, what we haven't done, our failures, where we've messed up, where we've fallen short, uh, any great accomplishments, it's because we are created in God's image and we are his treasured possession and he cares about us. Uh, in my early days of painting portraits, it was sort of painful to let them go. You know, uh, I would spend weeks and weeks working on a painting and then I'm like, I have to give it away. <laughs> of course, I got paid for it, but uh, but just to let it go was difficult. Now, I've, I've done it so much, it, there's actually a, a joy in that. But when you think about how God knit each of us together in our mother's womb, we're all precious in his sight, and how he loves us and cares about us. And that's a message that so many of these women haven't heard or haven't been able to grasp and to understand. And... Um, it was real interesting to me when uh, I, Beverly reached out to me about doing a portrait, and I was like, yes, I would love to do that. And uh, I ended up painting uh, Brenda McGahey. Uh, you can see her picture here. She's the executive director, and I mean, Me Melinda. She is Brenda's daughter. If I say something wrong, just yell out at me. Anyway, uh, I'm nervous. <laughs> uh, and so... When I said yes, uh, she sent me the book on uh, Miss Brenda and the Love Ladies because when I paint adults, if there's any information that I can get about them and their life before I even meet with them, it's very helpful to me. I just did uh, Chief Justice Robert Benham. Uh, his portrait has not been unveiled yet, but I immediately started researching him. I found a video online of him being interviewed and it was so delightful I felt like I got to know him a little bit and uh, recently I, I started a portrait of a mother with her d two daughters and I read magazine articles about her work and it's just so helpful to find out where somebody's coming from and uh, so when I read this book it was so powerful and so helpful to me to get an understanding of what's happening 
and Melinda, how she got kind of dragged into this because her mother started it, but how God really put a calling on her life with it. And um, so many of these women, the way they come in seeing themselves, it's not good. And I just want to share just a, a brief excerpt from this book. I read it, I guess it was maybe two years ago, a year and a half, it's, it's a while back. And I still remember the story of Walmart where uh, Brenda's taken, I believe she had six, she took to the Walmart store. Shortly after they moved into her home, she didn't know what to do with them. And so she was like, well, what if I give them each $100 and take them to Walmart and let them shop and they will love that. And so uh, when, they, when they get there, Shay, who um, you heard him talking about, uh, the first lady that was so rough, uh, and she described her as a keg of dynamite. She said, when she got to the store, she said, I turned around and there were the six of them stood frozen at the front of the store, their mouths hanging open in disbelief. And Shay said, what you looking at? And the woman looked away and picked up her pace. And I said, Shay, she wasn't, at look, she wasn't looking at you. You're going to get us kicked out of here. Well, she shouldn't be staring at us. She wasn't. Yes, she was, Shay said. She knows. Everyone knows. What does everyone know? They're all staring at us because they know we just got out of jail. Well, of course, that wasn't true. But anyway, Brenda's trying to talk them into going and picking out some personal things, and she's going to go to the toy aisle. And they said that they wanted to go to the toy aisle with her. <laughs> and she said, uh, Shay walked toward her and said, I'm coming with you. Why? I want to see the toys. Why the heck would you want to look at toys? What's wrong with that? I like toys. What? I don't get it. You've all been locked up for years and years. You have your freedom, and you have $100 to spend, and you want to look at toys? Give me a flipping break. Even as I spoke, I detected in Shay's expression something I hadn't noticed before. All that fierceness, that anger, that hate was really just a mask to hide her fear. Shay Curry was terrified. All these women were terrified. They had been incarcerated for so long that they had lost their dignity and their self-respect if they ever had any in the first place. They believed that normal folks around them could smell the stench of Tutwiler on them. They believed that others saw them the way they saw themselves, as losers, rejects, and outcasts who belonged behind bars and would most likely be back behind them soon. They were AIS, Alabama Institutional Serial Numbers. After all, that had been their name for decades. It had been etched onto the on their prison clothing. It had been seared into their souls. The prison had stripped them of everything, even their humanity. You're afraid, I said as I stared at Shay. Shay angrily narrowed her eyes. Lady, don't say that to us. We're not afraid. But this time she wasn't yelling. Her voice was almost a whisper. How we see people really matters. We're to love people no matter where they come from or what they're going through and it's so hard to do I know but that's one of the beautiful things of the portraits of hope is to see beyond how the women have defined themselves for so many years and help them to see who they really are as a woman of worth a woman of value a woman who's loved and when we look at the ministry of Christ in the uh, New Testament we see that he doesn't go away from the broken and the hurting, the suffering, the sinner. He goes toward them to help them to reach out a hand. And so as we're looking at how, as artists, how we're going to do this, um, I'm going to just share with you briefly um, an artistic vision and how, how do you approach a portrait. So the first time I went to the Love Lady Center, when I walked in the door, it was early on a morning, so there wasn't a lot going on. But I just got chill bumps up and down my arms when I walked in the door, and I sensed the presence of love everywhere. You could feel it. I could feel the love of Christ all around me. And then one of the young ladies took me up to meet um, Melinda in her office. And Melinda was just surrounded by young women 
there was this joy, this exuberance, and she just, knowing her from the book that I read and then meeting her in person, she's just this larger-than-life person who just is selfless in helping these women, helping their children, taking their children home with her if, if they need help, just doing everything she can to help these women. And so when I s started the uh, portrait, the first thing we do usually is take photographs. And the sitting is so important. And from an artistic point of view, I'm thinking about uh, when I s start this, what's the place, what's the background, the atmosphere going to be, the lighting, the mood, um, the viewpoint, uh, am I going to, is the viewer as we view the painting going to be looking up, going to be looking down, uh, the composition and just the placement of the figure, the gesture of the head, all of that helps tell a story. And so I knew how big her personality, her presence, her ministry was, how all the women looked to her and how she led them uh, in the auditorium area in Bible study and teaching. And so I felt like, well, I really want to do something with her on the podium because that's her place of ministry so much. And so I had her standing and did all these uh, photographs of her standing, took her outside, did a lot. And uh, I went back home and processed them. I had like 600 photographs. And I thought, these are all awful. <laughs> None of them captured her personality or really what I wanted to say. And so I just spent a lot of time thinking about it and how could I portray her reliance on Christ, her faith, and who she was as a person. And it just came to me, she had to be seated and not standing because of her humility in her service, of not considering herself better than anybody else, but reaching out to help these women. And so um, I actually brought in more lighting because the auditorium just kind of soaked up the light. The ceilings were so high with fluorescent lighting. And brought my daughter to help me. I brought a ladder so I could get up high and be looking down on her more to give the, the presence of the light of Christ shining down on her and her sitting at his feet and resting in his goodness. And you see there's an image of the cross in the back of the painting with the rays of light that's shining down on her. And also the first time I photographed her, she was in all black. And after just reading about her and being around her, I, I said, Melinda, you are too much fun and full of too much life and joy to be all in black. So you bring back something with color and you bring back some jewelry because I know you wear jewelry. <laughs> And she was so shy when I was photographing her. It's like she's not used to being the center of attention for somebody doing something for them. But anyway, uh, it, it really fell into place. And um, I really wanted people to see her resting, her trust, her knowing that no matter what's coming, that... The Lord has it, and um, I put a, I've always put a scripture verse, I'm a woman of faith, as you can probably tell, uh, with every painting I do under my signature, and I asked her what verse she wanted, it was 1 John 1, 9, we love because he first loved us, and um, just before you view the exhibit, there's something I want to just share about with you about how an artist um, tells a story, the tools that are in our hand to do it. And then you can look for it in the paintings and the tools the artists have used. Everybody has a different approach. But there's, we're all thinking about some of the same things. And uh, so when I go back to the studio and I start a portrait, I start thinking about what's going to be the most important thing. Is it going to be the emotion? Is it going to be the light, the mood, um, the values, the shapes? How am I going to you know, portray this? And um, some of the ways I do it are through uh, to get the, the emotion, the mood, is the, how you place the figure. These are things you have to think about at the sitting. Are they going to be looking directly at you? You'll see some of the portraits, the gestures, they're turned away. They're contemplating. They're looking ahead. I wanted uh, Melinda looking directly at us because she is confrontational in a good way. She's, she's like looking you right in the eyes and her big blue eyes are so important I had to have a little bit of a smile because she just always has so much joy on her but we use um, color 
to tell stories, there will be some of these portraits that are very vibrant, some that are very subtle, and um, the unity, the color temperature, whether a painting is warm in its, uh, the way it's portrayed or very cool. And uh, I'm gonna show you a couple of examples in just a minute. Uh, the chroma, how intense the colors are, or if they're very tonal and very close together, very subtle, because that'll create a more moody painting that's something that's, that's really electric and full of life. Um, the story that the shadows and the light tell, the shapes, the rhythms, the repeats um, that are there, the movement, we think about line, we think about direction, um, broken shapes, elegant flow, uh, lost and found edges, things where we don't want to draw the eye versus where we want. And if you, when you look at this painting in person, you will just see that her eyes are the most uh, focused part of the painting where we're drawing her attention. And as we move away down, those are more lost edges because that's not what the painting's about. And uh, another, another tool that uh, I had for years was I had a chase lounge in my studio. And so when I'm painting, I, s I would get back and sit in the lounge chair and view the painting, and then I could see what was wrong, and then I'd get back up and go uh, to the painting. But um, now I'm in a high-rise condo in a small little studio, and there's no room for my chase, so I'll take a picture with my iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> and that helps you really view a painting reduced down and see how does it read from a distance when it's really made a lot smaller. And that's, that's a great, great way to do it. But um, when I was um, reading this book now, which also is just filled, it's, it has the paintings, but it has the women's stories, and it has some blurbs from some of the artists. Um, and I know Dawn Whitelaw will be here tomorrow, but this painting that she did of, Carrie Baskin. Dawn talks about her stepping out of the darkness into the light and the hint of smile on her face. And you can see that in this painting, the story coming through and how Dawn used the uh, light and shadow to bring that out. And this painting that Melissa Crawford did, um, and this is of Amy Breckel, you can see the joy of relationship and the hope that she has in her life that's been restored and with her relationship with her child. And, um, and this one is uh, Brenda Anderson Bush. It was done by David Goatley. And he had gone one night when they were having a, a group meeting and women had brought the pictures of what they looked like when they arrived at the center. And he said he was just moved to tears seeing the women and he wanted this in the painting. And one of the things he used uh, from an artistic standpoint is when you squint your eyes or from, you don't have to do it, you're so far away, uh, but you can see that the majority of the painting is all the same value and color tones, and that's the dominant thing, but in the middle we see a much smaller image of who she used to be, and then the much larger presence of who she is now. And again, that's just how artists are using different things. And then here's a pre picture of Amanda, painting of Amanda that Richard Christian Nelson did. And we just see her confidence and her stability, even the horizontal line and then the column of her figure in the center, how it just gives such strength to this painting. The, sometimes the simplicity and the strength that is there uh, that he used. And then I just have to, uh, we've talked about Shay, and so this is Shay's portrait uh, when you see it in the exhibition and she was just such a larger than life person and character and I feel like Daniel Gerhardt just did an amazing job like, I feel like he captured this transformation she made in this joy and this peace she had and even as her hands out with the peace sign uh, I just love that and then um, a couple more this one is by Heather Marcus of Amy Haley this is one where we see cool lights, cool temperatures, and a lot of tonal things happening in the background where it's suggesting the winter of her life with the gate that she comes through and then to new life with the colors up front. And that's where color is used and temperature is used to tell a story from the coldness to the warmth. And then... Um, this is the last one I'll share, but this is Ellen Cooper of Rosie Mullen, and uh, she's, she works at the center. I'm not sure what her... Okay, 
Okay. So she didn't go through the program. She just came into work. But her vibrancy, her warmth, her character, and how Ellen captured that in the beauty of nature and the vibrancy. This is a very intense chroma painting and uh, instead of subtle. And so those are just different ways that um, artists use some of the tools at our hand to uh, portray. And then uh, the last thing I'll say in closing is that um, years ago when uh, Beverly owned Portrait Brokers, before she took over Portrait Zinc, um, she had asked me and a few other artists and some of the sales reps to be on an advisory board committee. And um, we met at her lake house. We spent, I think, two days or three days there. And it was so much fun. And when we sat, the first time I sat around the table, and I really didn't know Beverly well, and we were having times of discussion, different ideas, what we were doing well, what we could improve, you know, how could we make the company better. And Beverly was quiet. She was, she was quiet. She was taking it all in, looking around. But then it's like, John, I know you've seen this. You can see her wheels turning. Y'all know it, right? Like She doesn't have to speak. You just see it. And her eyes are lighting up, and she's getting ready. <laughs> and she'll come out with some big idea. And then the staff would kind of like chuckle and go, we got to make this happen. <laughs> and I know that's what happened with Portraits of Hope. When, you know, Beverly's wanting to get in there and join John in this, and how do we make this happen? And thank you, Beverly. Thank you for calling me and asking me to be a part of this and for the privilege. I felt like I was very privileged to get to know Melinda, to meet some of the women, and to just have the opportunity to do just a little bit to help this organization that um, is serving in a place now that used to be a hospital where the wounded came for healing. That's still happening right now. Um, my story is a little bit different in the sense that I um, was raised in a loving home, had parents who, you know, raised me and my little sister the best they could. We were raised in church. They're, they're still married today. Um, but I have always had the type of personality that loved to have a good time and loved to smile, just really outgoing. But at the same time, I had a hard time telling people no. And I wanted everyone to like me. I was a people pleaser. And so when I got into high school, uh, when people would ask me if, you know, I wanted to try alcohol or weed or whatever, I would, you know, of course say yes because I, I didn't want them to not like me. And that combination would lead me down the, the road of addiction. And so when I graduated high school, um, I started using more more heavy drugs and I graduated in May of 2003 and then the next year January 2004 I was got pregnant with my daughter Paige and then the next year in July of 2005 I was hanging out with a, a girl that I thought was my friend and I was set up and sold uh, drugs to an undercover agent and the next day they came and arrested me in the back of Texas Roadhouse Kitchen, about five narcotics agents, and took me out the back like I was just, you know, this murderer that they had been on the hunt for. And I remember getting in the back of the car and just, you know, in tears. All I could say was, my baby, my baby, my baby, because I knew that, you know, I, I might not see her again for a while. And six months later, I went to court, and I was sentenced to uh, one year and one week in prison, and I served the entire year and week. Uh, not too far from here in Atlanta, actually, at their um, prison there. And I was, you know, I would love to tell you that my story dramatically changed then, but it, you know, it didn't. If anything, I, used, I learned how to use drugs more and how to just have that sneaky kind of personality more in prison. And so when I, when I was released, I started looking at everyone around me, seeing, you know, the, the people I went to high school with graduating uh, getting ready to graduate college, start their families, getting married. And, you know, I kind of looked at my life and I was like, I'm just a, a drug addict fresh out of prison, single mom who, um, you know, 
just won't ever amount to anything. And so something inside of me at that point gave up. I just gave up hope. And over the next 10 years, I would spiral uh, into a deeper addiction, um, just uh, get into some, you know, abusive relationships. It was just a real drug-fueled um, relationship. And it was on January the 20th of 2017 um, we got into a fight just like always and I would call my parents and they would come get me you know how it normally went they would come get me I would go to their house and stay sober for about two weeks until I couldn't fight the urge to get high anymore and you know during those two weeks I would make all the promises to my mom and and my daughter that you know this this was it I was gonna get my life together and then I just couldn't fight the urge anymore and I would leave and go back into that um, relationship that environment and but on January 20th 2017 the same thing happened and my mom and dad came to get me but this time they were like you know you can't come back here you've got to get help and I just I think it was just the right combination of my parents finally putting their foot down and me just being sick and tired of living the way I was and I just said okay and they took me uh, to a place in LaGrange, Georgia, to a detox place where I spent a week. And that whole week, my mom was on the phone with Amy Haley, who's another in the Portraits of Hope. Um, and they got me a bed. And on January 27th, I entered the Love Lady Center. And I, um, you know, I entered that day, got settled. And then the next day, I was told about the chapel. And I went to the chapel and I hit my knees and I just, you know, the scripture talks about, you know, when we don't, when we know not what to pray, the Lord's interceding on our behalf. And I knew that in that moment, that's what he was doing because I couldn't form words. My heart knew what it wanted to say, but I couldn't, all I could do was cry. And when I left the chapel from that day forward, my life has, has never been the same. I um, just really took full advantage of what the Love Lady Center had to offer. I uh, did, you know, Every, I mean, you're only allowed to take six classes, but if I could have taken more, I would have. And I did every journal, I did every class, every activity outside of the Love Lady Center, just trying to, to do whatever I could to, you know, better my life. And I really had no goals while I was at the Love Lady Center of, you know, trying to like work towards my first house or my first car. I was just being obedient to what the Lord wanted me to do in that day. And I believe it's because of that where it's led me today. And um, I was actually last week filling out an application for my felonies to be pardoned. And I was on the part where it asked about your, your charitable contributions. And I was just overwhelmed at um, all the Lord has done in my life. You know, just the pages and pages. Just in um, six years, I... Um, left the Love Lady Center and I now work at another nonprofit called King's Home in Chelsea, Alabama. And I'm the co-director of their pottery program. We're a completely survivor run business and we employ women coming out of homelessness, sex trafficking, um, domestic violence, you know, the same situations that I was in. And I get to be a walk in testimony for these women every day that, you know, the Lord can take anybody and, and change their hearts and change their lives. And um, I've been, you know, I'm active in my, my church. I sing in the choir and on the praise team and um, got custody of my daughter back. I have been on uh, two mission trips. I have been went to Peru over the summer and uh, was actually able to lead a couple of drug addicts in Peru to the Lord, which is just, you know, crazy to me. Um, but just all these things. And for so long, my life was not considered a portrait of hope. It was the complete opposite. And so it's just, it's such an honor to have, you know, my portrait and, and for it to be called a portrait of hope. So thank you for letting me share. So uh, thank you to all of our speakers for coming today. Thank you for sharing this wonderful exhibition. Uh, if we've got a couple of questions, we'll take them for any of our speakers. Um, I also wanted to remind you about tomorrow night, which is the resource fair and the opening uh, reception for the exhibition. 
One of our speakers will be our state representative, Matthew Gamble, who's with us here today and been very supportive of the museums and of this exhibition in particular and the local efforts to battle addiction and bring recovery and those things to our area. So thank you for being here today. Yeah, you can give a round of applause. Anybody any questions? Okay, might be something you want to talk about more personal with the folks. So they'll be around and we'll be heading downstairs to the exhibition in the Borderlands Gallery. So we will adjourn to that space. Thank you for coming out. Don't forget the gala and uh, next month's Art for Lunch, February 1st with artist Phil Epp. Thank you for coming. <laughs>